Hello, Rob McIver here. Let's talk about the subjunctive mood of the verb in the Greek New Testament and think about tips on how to make them easier to identify, translate, and interpret. It's normal that I would approach a new topic by comparing the English grammar with the Greek grammar, but with subjunctives, it's probably best just to concentrate on the Greek subjunctive without thinking too much of the English subjunctive. That's because, as you can see in this diagram, while English uses the subjunctive quite a lot, Greek maybe uses it a little bit more. It's hard to judge. There is some overlap between the English and the Greek usage, but most of it doesn't overlap. And the bits that do overlap aren't particularly helpful in understanding the Greek subjunctive. So we're just going to begin by looking at the Greek subjunctive. In fact, there's lots of good news about the subjunctive. It seems strange to begin with a vocabulary, but the majority of the uses of the subjunctive in the New Testament follow one of these words. In other words, they form a clear signal to expect a subjunctive. Not only this, the subjunctives are reasonably easy to recognize. And ha, the biggest bonus of all, is they are very predictable in the way that the constructions work. So when you meet a subjunctive, you can expect that it will be straightforward to translate and also reasonably clear in interpretation. So that's the good news about subjunctives. Now that we will approach our task with a slightly more positive viewpoint, let's look at how subjunctives are formed. Now here, we have a table that gives both the present indicative active and the present subjunctive active of luo. You'll see on the left-hand column, luo, luais, luai, luom, and luiti, lusen. That's the form of the present indicative of luo. On the right-hand column, we've got luo, luais, luai, luomen, luata, luosen. Now, do you see what the pattern is? I explain to my students with the phrase, go long. <laughs> I know this can be a sporting term, but it, it has a slightly different meaning here. But if you look at the first person plural, for example, lu omen becomes lu omen. The omicron becomes omega. Lu eti becomes lu eti. The epsilon becomes eta. And it makes sense with lu ice, the second person singular. The epsilon becomes eta, and the iota becomes an iota subscript. And even the third person plural, luusen, becomes luosen. All predictable, the vowel at the beginning of the ending lengthens. The only trouble is you can't tell on the first person singular, can you? Because luo and luo is accented exactly the same way. Normally the context will tell us, as I have just said, subjunctives are signaled with one of the words that are in the vocabulary and you will know to expect a subjunctive, and if it is luo, well then the odds are that it is in fact a subjunctive. Does go long work for the middle voice? And the passive voice as well, because the form is the same for both the middle and passive voices. We have decomai, decay, deketai, decometha, dekesta, decontai for the middle indicative active of decomai. Now, the present subjunctive active of decomai is decomai, decay, decatai, decometha, decaista, decontai. And yes, it does work. With decomai, the ending on the verb starts with an omicron, which turns into an omega in the present subjunctive middle. When we get to the third person singular, the etai becomes etai. The epsilon goes long, it becomes an eta. First person plural same deal. The only tricky bit here is the second person singular, which happens to be a long in the present indicative, and therefore when it goes long, it's already long, so we can't tell the difference. But again, the context will tell us. A subjunctive is usually signal with one of the words that I have just shown you in that vocabulary. Well, what about the aorist? Well, the aorist indicative active of luo is elusalusas elusen. And if we look at the aorist subjunctive active, it is luso, luseis, luse. Oh, go long. Uh, yes, it's kind of worked, but we've got something else happening here. 
what is happening. Well, we've added a sigma, and then we've used O, Ace, A, Omen, Eta, Osen. Those were the endings that Luo had for the present subjunctive active. So it kind of makes sense once you've seen it. You will no doubt remember that with LU sa, the aorist indicative active interacted with the consonants at the end of the verb stem, and for some of them in a quite predictable manner. It does something similar with a subjunctive. Down the bottom you'll see a summary that you'll probably recognize except for the last line. So a guttural plus a sigma forms a xi. A labial plus a sigma forms a psi, and a dental disappears. It just leaves a bare sigma. Now, eo and eo verbs before the sigma of the aorist subjunctive lengthen to eta. And that's not totally unexpected, you must admit. All right, let's look at some examples. We have blepo, which in the present indicative goes blepo, blepice, blepi, etc. In the present subjunctive, it goes blepo, blepace, blepe, etc. In the aorist indicative, it goes eblepsa, eblepsas, etc. And in the aorist subjunctive, it goes blepso, blepsace, etc. And that is a labial, b, with a sigma making a psi. Let's look at doxadzo. Doxadzo in the present indicative goes doxadzo, doxadzeis, etc. In the present subjunctive is doxadzo, doxadzeis, doxadze, etc. In the aorist, it's edoxasa. The zeta acts somewhat like a dental, doesn't it, for doxadzo? And it goes edoxasa, edoxasas, edoxasin, etc. Now, in its aorist subjunctive, it goes doxasso, doxasseis, doxasse, etc. Again, if we have understood the weak aorists and what happens when the gutturals or labials and dentals interact with a sigma, none of this is very surprising. Let's look at pytho. We have pytho, pythase, pythae, etc. in the present indicative. In the present subjunctive, it's pytho, pythase, pythae. We've gone long. In the aorist indicative, it's episa, episas, because the theta is a dental and the dental disappears. And so its subjunctive aorist is piso, pisais, pisa, pis omen etc. Now, what about the aorist of middle verbs? Well, in my book, Beginning New Testament Greek Made Easier, we've postponed learning about the aorist indicative for middle voice and passive voice, but we can talk about the aorist subjunctive because it does something expected. We have the sigma adding to the chi of decamai to make dexomai, Dex a, dex ata. And as you can see, we have just reused the endings of the present middle subjunctive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's harder to say than to actually see. If you, if you look at it, you can see that there's the sigma being used and then the endings of the present subjunctive. It's doing exactly what the active voice does to form its aorist subjunctive. So, that's another bit of good news. But what about the strong aorist, you ask me? And thank you for asking. So, here we have our pattern verb we're using to illustrate strong aorist. It's the strong aorist of lambano, which in the indicative mood, it's elabon. The indicative shows us that the aorist verb stem from lambano is lab. So, we take the aorist verb stem, lab, and add, you guessed it, the endings of the present subjunctive. It goes labo, labase, labe, labomen, labate, labosen. Once you're familiar with it, it's not so bad. And here we have some examples of how these strong aorist verbs work. 
we have got a column for present indicative, present subjunctive, aorist indicative, and aorist subjunctive. And in fact, once we know the aorist indicative, we can work out the aorist subjunctive. I suggest we begin with estheo. Estheo, in the present indicative, goes estheo, 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 etc. In the subjunctive, it goes estheo, estheace, estheo. Notice the ice turns into ace. It goes along, and the iota becomes an iota subscript. The aorist of estheo is epigon. You knew that because you had memorized it. There's no way to work it out if you don't know it. From epigon, we can see the aorist root of the verb estheo. We discard the augment at the beginning of the word, and we discard the aorist ending, and we are left with fag. And it is fag that we use as the basis for the aorist subjunctive. And to that, we add the endings of the present aorist subjunctive, which is o, ace, a, omen, eta, osen. A similar pattern can be observed with bellow. In the present tense, both in the indicative and the subjunctive, bellow has two lambdas. The present indicative goes bellow, bellis, belli. The present subjunctive goes bellow, bellace, belli. The epsilon has gone long and the iota has become an iota subscript. The aorist of bellow is ebellon. It's different from the present because the aorist only has one lambda. And we can determine the root of ebellon from discarding the augment and the ending, which leaves bell with one lambda. So the aorist subjunctive active is bell o, bell ace, bell a. Etc. Now let's go back to ago. It seems trivial to note, but ago starts with a vowel. So when we come to the aorist, the alpha has become an eta, a gag on. Now to work out the aorist subjunctive active, we start with the strong aorist, a gag on. We have to reverse the lengthening of the alpha, so eta becomes alpha. And we take the gag, so that is the aorist root of the verb ago. And it goes agago, agagais, etc. Now there's a couple of other verbs that do interesting things. We have lego, which has got the aorist of ipon. You can see from its aorist subjunctive that the actual aorist root of the verb lego is ipe. And the subjunctive goes ipo, ipace. I pay, etc. Now something slightly different happens with horao. No present subjunctive actives of the verb horao are found in the New Testament. But there are over 30 occasions where we have an aorist subjunctive active of horao. The aorist indicative active is iden, and when we come to the verb root, unlike ipon, which retained the epsilon, Idon loses the epsilon to become ido, ido, idace, ida, etc. So that's just some examples about how the strong error subjunctives are formed. Here we have something quite interesting. We have the present subjunctive active of I me. <laughs> and I don't know, you find it as amusing guys I do. The present subjunctive of I me is O, Ace, A, Omen, Eta, Osen. Do you recognize them? They are exactly the endings used on the regular present <laughs> subjunctive actives of all verbs. Just with I me, we've lost the verb entirely into the endings. Ah, oh dear. Well, anyway, uh, you, will, you will recognize them when you see them. I me, of course, is a me verb. Let's see what happens to the other me verbs as they form their subjunctives. Here we have the present and error subjunctives of the verb tithemi. As you can see, the present subjunctive active is titho, tithes, tithe, tithoma, tithata, tithosin. Once you know the first person present subjunctive active of tithemi is titho, you can work out the rest quite easily. Did you like the aorist? Look at this. 
We're really down to the essential element of Tithomi, aren't we? Just the theta is left. Again, the only way you can know that is by memorizing it. On this slide, I have noted down the present and era subjunctives of the different me verbs. And maybe more interestingly and more importantly, I have noted down the number of times those forms are found in the New Testament. Now, you will quickly work out why I have highlighted some of these in yellow. For example, FO is found nine times in the New Testament. It is the era subjunctive active of Aphiami. Its present subjunctive active isn't found at all. Neither is the present subjunctive active of Daiknumi. <laughs> so they probably aren't worth spending time learning as vocabulary items. Ditto, the present subjunctive active of Didomi is only found twice. Again, probably not a high priority, but its aorist, do, do, days, day, domen, etc. <laughs> Again, reduced down to the absolutely essential part of the verb, eh? Um, that is found 36 times. The present subjunctive active of I, me, is found 70 times. So that really is well worth knowing. And I, me, doesn't have an aorist tense. The present subjunctive of histomy is not found. His aorist is found 15 times. It is sto. And for tithomy, the aorist is found 14 times. The present subjunctive is only found twice. So that gives us clues as to where to prioritize our memorization of these verbs and their aorists. The three of them that occur most frequently are aorist forms, aside from the present subjunctive of imi. Let's look at how the subjunctive is used in the New Testament. Probably its biggest use is with Hina. Hina is found 673 times in the New Testament, most of them in conjunction with a subjunctive. And when it's used with a subjunctive, it forms a purpose or final clause. They're actually reasonably straightforward to translate. They are certainly easy to recognize. So let's look at John 5.40, for example. Kai uk for later el thine prosma, and you do not wish to come to me, hina, in order that zoane ekata. Well, ekata, so that you might have, what? Life. So that life you might have, <laughs> in the order there. But of course, zoane is in the accusative case, so it is the direct object of ekata. John 3.17. Uga epistylen ho theos ton huion eis ton cosmon, for God did not send his son into the world, hina in order, krine ton cosmon, in order to judge the world. Usually translated as condemn the world, but it's kind of good English to do so, but you do miss the extra richness of knowing it's a translation of the verb krino, which means judge. It has kind of a feel of the last judgment attached to it. So when we see Hina in the New Testament, we think, yes, we're expecting a subjunctive and usually we will find one. And when we find a subjunctive, we are translating a purpose clause. A second frequent use of the subjunctive is in certain conditional sentences following the word an, for example. And these are known as the more probable future conditions. En may fagate. If you do not eat, tain saka tu huion tu anthropu. If you do not eat the flesh of the son of man. Now, if you do not is probably best translated with the English unless. So unless you eat the flesh of the son of man. And en tis ton emon logon te reise. Thanaton u may. Theo race ice ton Iona. We'll come back to the ume in the next section, but let's just look at the first part of the sentence. And unless tis without the accent, unless somebody ton em on logon accuses the case, it's the direct object, 
te reso. So unless somebody keeps my word. So the rest of the sentence will follow from that. But the te reso is from te reo, an eo verb, and you can see the epsilon is turned to eta before the sigma. If anyone keeps my word. Again, when you find an an in a sentence, it's almost always followed by a subjunctive and almost always straightforward to translate, certainly to understand and to interpret. I've listed here several other words that are almost always followed by a verb in a subjunctive mood in the Greek New Testament. And may, unless. Hosan or hos an, whoever. Hotan, whenever, and ume, definitely not. Ume is not just not, it's definitely not. It's described as strong denial. So let's look at some examples of how these words are used in the New Testament. We've already translated some of John 8.51. Eantis ton emon logon tereso. If anyone keeps my word, thanaton ume theorese eis ton iona. Looking for the verb first, theoreso is it's the error subjunctive of the oreo, isn't it? I see. U may definitely not see. Now, this might be eris, but of course this event is talking about something potentially happening in the future because it's contingent on if. If anyone keeps my word, then in the future they will definitely not see death and that's underlined by saying ice ton iona into the eons, normally translated as forever. Ume, strong denial. There's another one in the next verse, John 4, 48. Ean me se maya te terata idata. So the verb is idata. It's the era subjunctive of horeo. And and may means unless, unless you see signs and wonders, u may pistusata, you will definitely not believe. Yes, again, here is one of the places where we need to read the Greek to get the full impact of what Jesus is saying. It's not you won't believe, it's you'll definitely not believe. And John 9, 5, hot and into cosmo o, while or whenever I'm in the world, while I'm in the world, phos I me to cosmo, I am the light of the world. So we've already commented on the use of the eris subjunctive, and in fact, the eris subjunctive is kind of the default tense for the subjunctive. It's used 1,397 times in the New Testament compared to only 494 present tense subjunctives. So the aorist is the default tense. The author may have selected the aorist tense just because that's the normal tense rather than making a specific point. But when the present tense of a subjunctive is chosen, it clearly has something to say. And again, the difference between a present subjunctive and an aorist subjunctive is not that of time. It is of aspect. So... A present subjunctive has an imperfective aspect. It views the action as ongoing. For example, it might be talking about something that's happening in a continuous manner, a continuous actions art. An error subjunctive is perfective, and that means the action is viewed as a whole. It can have a just a one-off. It can be punctilia in actions art. By the way, in my series of videos, there is a separate video talking about the use of tense in the New Testament where I explain at some depth what actions art is and what aspect is, especially perfective and imperfective aspects. Now, it can be useful for the interpreter to know the difference between an aorist subjunctive and a present subjunctive. When you're translating, though, it's very hard to indicate any difference between the two tenses. So let's think of some tips that'll make it easier to recognize, translate, and interpret verbs that are found on the subjunctive mood. Well, the first tip is mildly surprising. I've made similar 
suggestions before. So that's why it's only mildly surprising. The best way to be able to recognize an error subjunctive is to be able to recognize aorist indicatives, particularly the strong aorist. Memorize the aorist indicatives of the strong aorist verbs, and that will help you quickly identify the aorist roots used to form the aorist subjunctives. Similarly, while me verbs are quite regular once you know where they start in their first person singular, how they get to the first person singular is kind of idiosyncratic. They've got to be memorized too. I would concentrate on memorizing first those that are found more frequently in the New Testament though. Now, to help you with this, there is an appendix in my book, Beginning New Testament Greek Made Easier, Appendix J, which gathers together many of the frequently occurring verbs in the New Testament and provides there the present indicative, present infinitive, present subjunctive, aorist indicative, aorist infinitive, aorist subjunctive. So you've got them all listed in a table. So we begin with the regular verbs. <laughs> There's three of them. Then we go to strong aorists. Then we have eo and eo verbs. And then we have me verbs. Then we have interesting verbs of various kinds. So that is a very helpful appendix. Now, aside from that, subjunctives are pretty much wall-to-wall -wall good news for the student because they come with a small number of words that are frequently found in the New Testament, and those words provide a strong clue. Look for a subjunctive, because they are almost always followed by a subjunctive. They form constructions that are predictable and easy to translate and easy to interpret. It's all pretty much win-win. Subjunctives are your friends. <laughs> yes, I say that of test to my students. But yes, subjunctives are really nice to find when you're working through a difficult passage that's got participles and other things that are hard to manage. They are predictable and they are given a strong signal that they're about to occur. The most important thing, though, of course, is to practice. Practice translating out of the New Testament. And if you're looking for an exercise that gives you practice in recognizing and translating subjunctives, there is an exercise in chapter 22 of my book, Beginning New Testament Greek Made Easier, that you might find helpful. This video is part of a series of videos on the grammar of the Greek New Testament. You can most conveniently find the other videos by clicking on the subscribe button below and on the channel New Testament Greek Made Easier, you will find the series of videos, including several videos dealing with the mood of verbs in the Greek New Testament. Hey, if you found this video helpful, why don't you let me know by clicking on the like button below.